Do you do you believe S S E T is still up date today? Yeah, I think <laughs> yes. Uh, I think the certainly there are you know trends toward more structured psychoeducational approaches, but you know the fundamentals of human existence and cope and human emotion haven't changed very much. And I do think that what we do with S E T. Um, addresses those issues, and I and that hasn't changed. And I think the evidence that is published about its effectiveness is strong and provides strong support for it. And there are new things. You know, I think what we're learning now is that there are many stress and support related factors that we know have an effect on disease progression. And so it suggests that there is a real power, not just psychological, but a biomedical power. Mm -hmm of emotional support and that's the kind of thing that I think we mobilize in in SET and that that hasn't changed oh. there are more opportunities for social contact so there's uh -huh. the internet and you know Facebook and Twitter and all that so there are other ways people with common problems can connect and I think that's very good we've done a, f a bit of study of can you adapt this to online work yes. and it seems to work surprisingly well. You know, I think of it as a kind of template that can be applied and adapted in various ways. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not all strictly speaking SET, but a lot of the principles that it's a good idea, not a bad idea, to get people together, that they give and take support from one another, that they can deal with emotions that come from the disease, that talking about the disease is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Those are all principles of SET that I think are now being applied in, in more diverse ways, and, and that's fine. That's true. Yeah. What, what would you say? What is needed? What kind of setting, what kind of atmosphere, what kind of attitude, working attitude, so existential issues can unfold and mm -hmm. can be worked through and can be... Well, in, if you're working with cancer patients, it, it, it's, it's, it just flows very regularly. If you're working with with patients who are not not ill physically, then it, it's something different. But a, an existential approach also kind of uh, also leads to a kind of a different in in uh, the therapist and patient relationships. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I don't think that's necessarily unique. I mean, Carl Rogers was his approach to this and being much more. And uh, long before I thought wrote that book, I was even in, in as a group leader. I feel it's much more important to be more open and self-revealing as a way of not differentiating yourself from the group and modeling to the group how how you could be with other people. So um, anyway, that, that, that's that's my approach to, to existential issues, and I, I, sooner or later. Almost all my patients will deal with such issues as we go along in therapy, but some, you know, it's not as important for others. The patients I'm having who are dealing with, with, with cancer, it's, uh, it tends to be very important. It is, it is very important, and, and, and it cut, but still, at least my experience in the group, it's not that even cancer patients come and say, well, now we have to talk about meaning of life. <laughs> <laughs> It comes, and over the years, I learned to listen and to to hear when it comes. Right. And maybe so often I miss it, sure. and you know sometimes. So why, how, and the relationship is an Im important and interesting thing. Yeah. How do we how do we relate to patients? How do we relate to a group? So it can come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Sometimes people will do a lot of other kinds of work, and then get down to these issues. I have mm -hmm. someone I'm seeing in therapy, I've been seeing him for a while, and he's, uh, he's worked on a lot of issues with his father and uh, uh, other, and, but now he's sort of getting to the idea that all these other th issues have been cleared up, and he started wondering about what meaning his life has. Um, so it may, it, yeah, there's this, this uh, Maslow long ago, you know, talked mm -hmm. about this hierarchy of needs, and and the existential needs are, are further down on the list. We've got to solve the issues of, of subsistence and, and relationship and everything. And when, when these are, are kind of resolved, then we kind of okay. deal with the existential issues. There's today a lot about mindfulness-based therapies, mm -hmm. acceptance-based mm -hmm. yeah. therapies. Right. How, it, it, 
are there some somehow is there an association possible? Is that something totally different? Would you see a link? I I, I think I think there's a big link, and I, you know we have lots of little labels for things we do. So we would mm -hmm. end our groups rather than begin them with training in self hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And there are differences, but I think hypnosis is sort of the Western version of mindfulness, where you shift your mental states, you narrow your focus of attention, you get your body floating, you dissociate your somatic reaction from your psychological reaction, and you learn to control problems like pain and anxiety. And we did that in the group. And we also used it, I think, as a powerful way to kind of conclude the group. So, the, you know, to, to sort of be mindful about what the major issue in the group was. So I would have the women picture, you know, somebody who had died recently and how you feel coming face to face with the fact that she's no longer there. But on the other side of the screen, um, think of something she left with you that stays with you even though she's gone. So it was a way of doing some grieving but restructuring um, you know, the meaning of this person's death. Uh, that idea of being more open to your feelings is what we try to do in the group. Well, sometimes it <coughs> seems to me that this kind of group process, when it really goes into the group and in the here and now, mm -hmm. uh, brings, brings mindfulness along. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You're, you're Without training it. Right. You're, it, it just it, happens, it, yeah. It, I it brings a, a kind of presence to people and to, to be there and to be attentive to themselves. Yes, I, I think that's true. Without telling them to do it, they are paying more attention to their own inner life, to mm -hmm. other people's inner And of course, it's, it's sort of contagious. You know, if there's somebody mm -hmm. in the room who is being very open and direct, um, it will draw you in. And I think you're right in the same way when people engage in this kind of openness about their own feelings and and dealing with these very difficult issues, it tends to make you more open and draw you in too. You know, unless you backpedal very hard, you tend to get pulled it into it as well. And so, uh, you know, I think also one of the powerful things about groups is that they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And our patients mm -hmm. used to say, you know, there, it is so different to think about dying soon at two o'clock in the morning in bed by myself than it is to talk about it at two o'clock in the afternoon with nine other women who have the same problem I do. It's the same problem, but it feels very different. And so the thing about groups is you know you feel a little less frightened about getting into it because you know you're going to get out of it. That, that you know There's a time and a place for dealing with it. You do it. Mm -hmm. And then you can put it aside and go on right. and do other things, yes. you know, because many people think, you know, it's like Pandora's box. I open it and the feelings will start and they'll never stop, you know, and it's not true, you know. And that's one of the lessons of mindfulness is that, you know, you sort of witness, you don't try to control or suppress your emotions. You just let them happen and see where they go. And they start and they flow and they stop, mm -hmm. you know. And that's a lesson in life that I think people do get from this too, that you can deal with just absolutely the worst things and they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you can deal with it and move on to something else. Mm. A, famous, a famous quotation of yours is, um, help patients to hope for the best mm -hmm. and prepare to the, for the worst. Yeah. Yeah. How does this work in groups? Well, you know, there, the concern is that we deprive people of hope by having them face death, basically. And, you know, if you think about it, and I, you know, I understand the concern, right? There is that sense. And yet, um, what I try to help people, you know, what I see people doing is changing what they hope for. You know, obviously, even with very bad disease, you hope that somehow your body will deal with it better or your doctors will get better at treating it. But on the other hand, you recognize that that, that may not happen. So some of it is not, you know, do we hope or not? I mean, you know, all of our lives ultimately, you know, end in death. I mean, it's going to happen to all of us sooner or later. So it's really a matter of what you hope for and how you plan to live your life, you know, while you've got it. And in a sense, by sort of hanging on in this all or none way, that either I'm cured of my cancer or I'm dead, you say, well, this is the life I've got. How am I going to live it as well as I can, as long as I can? And that can be hopeful. And so I don't think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between how long you live and how much hope you have. And what we try to do is get people to 
live as well as they can, as long as they can, figure out what to hope for that, that can actually be a fulfilling experience for them and, and find a way to do it. And, you know, if, if we've learned nothing else, you know, in the last 35 years of studying this, it's that um, it, the, the confrontation with mortality does not demoralize patients, it remoralizes them. They, mm -hmm. they come to see the limitations that the illness is imposing on them, but they live better because they do. And, you know, death is not a novel idea to a cancer patient. You know, it's, uh, it's not the last thing they think of, it's the first thing they think of. Mm -hmm. So if they see someone else die with a disease, it, they don't say, oh my God, I could die from this. They've thought that already, but they see how one can face their death, how they can die. They also say, you know, we were all dealt the same hand and I'm still here, you know, and I'm very sad that she's died, but she lived fully and she did what she wanted to do in the time she had, and I hope I can do that too. So it's not demoralizing. So How do we teach this best to young colleagues and to work in the here and now and to bring things into the room? That's a good question. I, uh, you know, you know, part of it is just to get them to see it in action. Because mm -hmm. once you see it, you don't forget it. You know, we. Mm -hmm. Somebody once said that a doctor, you, 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 you may forget what a doctor said to you, but you'll never forget how he treated you. You know, and there's a sense in which we have these memories of, you know, the way people are with us. That are, you know, we have to. We evolve this a social species and we have to get good at reading people's emotional interactions with us or we didn't survive in the old days. Um, and so I think there's something about seeing it, things happen that are real. They're not just a memory or a rep repetition. They're a real event happening that, that is a very powerful force. And so, you know, I try to teach that all the time and I, and I think, you know, if you have a choice, bring it into the room, focus on what's happening right here and right now. Now that involves taking risks, you know, because mm -hmm. you'll have real feelings about what's happening, people will have real feelings about you, you're a little more vulnerable, you know, and Irv focus, or emphasizes transparency a lot too, that you have to be open to being called on what you're doing, um, you have to, you're a better therapist if you can honestly say, well I was feeling criticized or hurt that you were focusing on someone else, not me, you have to be more open and direct. So it involves taking risks in a way that we often don't. Do you have any advice? How can young therapists today learn this? How can this be taught? Well, that's, that's what I've tried to do with, with my book. And I did a lot of uh, teaching, you know, with observation, having therapists observe my work. But you, you've, you've got to have a good teacher. I wrote the textbook spending a lot of, a lot of effort to try to teach people how to work with process, how to work with what's going on between you and the patient or the patients. With you, you really need a supervisor or a teacher who can help model that for you. So um, I encourage people in their training to try to locate someone in their community who can be a supervisor for them. Yeah, you need a lot of, a lot of time. I, I used to have all the residents do co-therapy and I would, when I supervised the residents and their groups, I spent probably as much time working on the, their relationship with one another than I did with their relationship with the group. Because you have to have a, a team that, that are comfortable in working with one another. Yeah. So the co-therapy relationship is very important. It, it tends to be less used in, in practice because it's less economical. Uh, but I, I, I feel it's a very effective mode. The groups get started and work much better that way. I'm really glad that you have, you know, uh, you know, carried the flag and are and are helping it to develop. And I, you know, I think, um, you know, there is something fundamental about this process of helping people face and cope with their illness. I think it helps. You know, if nothing else, it helps patients feel better about themselves in a genuine way. In that, not only do they receive help and the benefit of advice and wisdom, but they come to feel like experts in living, that they're giving advice, that there's something useful that has come out of their confrontation with illness. And I'm glad that that's spreading to, to Germany and the German-speaking world and that um, people are learning how they can be of, genuinely be of help to one another and that patients see themselves not just as patients but as also experts in dealing with cancer and what it means. And, uh, you know, I think there is a hunger among patients for more than just you know, you know, 
do the operation and give me the medication and do the radiotherapy. That, that, you know, we, we devote more social resources to teaching people how to drive cars than how to live with cancer, you know, and yet there's no reason why you should know how to deal with it. So I think the whole idea that, that good medical care involves helping people live well with whatever they've got to face uh, is a great idea, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm glad that it's spreading. So I hope it's just the beginning.